the black metal scene came out of a lot of different sounds. It wasn't primarily Nordic. Black metal by Venom was obviously the start of it all. Welcome, this is Revolver. I'm Christina. We have the delightful Danny Filth of Cradle of Filth with us today. What do you think of the three most definitive black metal records? My quintessential black metal album of all time, if it was a go-to black metal album, would be In the Night Side Eclipse by Emperor. Over and above everything else. I once sat on a cliff on a mountain, staring at the full moon, drunk on Jägermeister listening to that record, and had a very, very magical experience. Almost got frostbite as well. Obviously, uh, Don Mistress by Mayhem is a massively influential record, as is, and you can't forgive it, the very first dark phone record, A Blaze in the Northern Sky. Obviously, I'd say Don't Break the Oath, Infernal Overkill, Venom Black Metal, obviously, and probably, I would say The Return by Bathory, but it would have to be in uh, under the sign of the black mark. And I guess the kind of cool thing about all that is is to become entranced by that mysticism and then create your own narrative out of it. Like that's kind of the beginning and you create a narrative well, out of it. That's how it started. And when I, when I look back to the beginning, I hear people's opinions on it now. People are going to hate that just as much as they look back and hate the way that Cradle were. They listen to that, you know, like people like Fenris and go, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I'm really, in, yeah. I'm so Nordic it hurts, you know, when they live in America or whatever. <laughs> um, and everybody remembers things a different way. What I remember is what happened. Um, the black metal scene came out of a lot of different sounds. It wasn't primarily Nordic. Uh, you had Necromantia from Greece. You had um, Necrodeath from Italy. You had Profanatica and Absu from the States. And... Uh, Blasphemy, you had uh, Moonspell from Portugal, you had, uh, I mean, Kelly Frost was Swiss, but you had yeah people from around the world. I mean, even Nordic countries had a very vast array of very different bands. Early Dark Tranquility, Dissection, yeah. Impaled Nazarene, Beherit, Vine Christ from, from Greece as well. All these bands were extremely different from one another. There was no um, key ingredient or key sound. And we were just one another band in that vein. Um, the, the next wave that came along, which were the sort of Bulgarovs and uh, the more Polish oriented, that started melding into a, a sound, a combined sound that was had a, a feel of itself. But it was it was more concise. It wasn't as varied as the origins of black metal. I remember that was the second wave anyway. Mm. As I said, the origins came from Sabbath and Merciful Fate and Early yeah. Destruction, Bathory and, you know, all these weird and wonderful thrash metal bands with a satanic edge. I'd be interested to know, I mean, obviously it's been talked about a lot, but when um, Aronimus died and that became like a huge thing around the world where black metal was suddenly on the front page around the world, what was that like to witness from your place in Britain and, and see something that you'd obviously been interested in and involved with for a long time suddenly get a lot of very full-on attention? I was pen pal with Euronymous as well for a while. Um, I was pen pal with a lot of people, to be honest. Um, obviously, we toured with early incarnations of Dissection and Emperor. But yeah, I do remember on that tour, Bard Faust telling me quite drunkenly that he'd killed um, a man. And I didn't take it seriously, so I don't want to be complicit. I don't want to be dragged back into this as a as, as a witness and I should have come forward. Because honestly, when somebody tells you that, you just think it's a drink talking. So oh, no. when I did find out that it happened, obviously I was like, whoa. Um and the church burnings as well. Mm. Um, naturally, we couldn't do any of that because our church is made of flint. But it wasn't without, it wasn't for want of trying. We didn't, this. we didn't try burning anything, but we did do a lot of photo shoots in yeah. famous churches. And much like the, you know, the famous hammer horror scenes of people being driven out by pitchfork wielding, um, you know, Monster baiting, uh, not, not masturbating, monster baiting. 
the villagers were very much similar. The Clock Peel incident was like that. We had villagers turning up, seeing what was going on. There was one in Colchester as well, where they literally came with pitchforks to, to drive us away, where we were doing a, a photo shoot with Metal Hammer. Uh, at a church that once apparently was uh, set on fire by Satanists. That's the closest uh, we got to that. The church burning. Yeah, you know. You know how it goes. Okay, what but are the three... Youthful, youthful exuberance. That's why I put it down to youthful exuberance. Would the Samoths and the Bards and uh, the, the Vargs of today's world, would they be quite so, you know, uh, youthful and overzealous if nowadays would they would they think it was a good idea probably not um and also norway is well you know, to actually murder to actually murder people they wouldn't think it was a good idea yeah yeah well also the, the, the judiciary system is very different now i mean honestly you know, you, you can murder someone and be out uh, having a holiday in about three weeks time um yeah well yeah i mean so what a world it, it, it didn't destroy their lives as it destroyed people lives they took you know so th there's all kind of perspectives on that anyway but we won't dwell on it Frank did a, a very big article and we got very much in trouble with the police after that because um there was an editor at Krang at the time called Jeff Barton who was a bit of an arsehole to be honest uh, everybody said so even the people who worked with him uh, allegedly and um he kind of berated us in in the press you know uh as as the British press want to do, they build up a British band and then they feel like we've created this monster so we can dash it down and mm. split it asunder how we feel fit, when we feel fit. So, um, of course, they totally ignored the British scene to start with. You know, why would they? It's only in their own country. And they went straight to the Nordic scene because obviously it was way more interesting because people were dying. Um, but yeah, we uh, he wrote something bad about us. It was confrontation. We went to see him at his work to say, well, what the fuck, man? Bit of a confrontation. I pushed him over his desk. He called the Metropolitan Police in the next day. I was uh, Regent Park's police station with a massive dossier uh, from the special branch put in front of me. It was literally like that. And it was just full. And believe it or not, full of stuff on Burzum, the Black Metal Circle, it was stuff from Nordic newspapers. It was from stuff from all around the world. You would not have believed how much the British police had their eye on this. And they had oh. to get out of it that you guys are not into this, are you? You really are not because we have your, our eyes on you. What was your first like introduction into the tape trading scene? Like, How did you get started with that? And who was the first person you wrote to? Yeah, basically tape trading, writing letters. I was drawing magazine covers to get features in underground zines. Everything was grimy and low-key back in then. Letters were handwritten. There was more mysticism because you didn't know what people looked like. I mean, Burzum, for example, there was one shitty photo of him that looked like he was eight foot tall standing in the middle of a room. Similarly well-produced black metal album was kind of unheard of. And Uga Karma sounded great. At the time, I thought Immortal sounded great. Listen to it now, it's all, you know, not quite there. But people thought the principle of evil my flesh was cutting edge at the time. And it sounds possibly barbaric when you listen to it nowadays. But yeah, I think that was a good turning point as well in my sort of musical career. Yeah. The principle of evil made flesh, I think sounds fantastic now. There is a warmth to your music that I think, yeah, does make it more embraceable and emotional. We come from a different criteria of, of backgrounds. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the Norwegian stuff was all, you know, based on Norse mythology and Tolkien harsh winters and bitterness and you know it's frostbitten grim. whereas ours is more about lasciviousness and decadence and gothic horror basically we came from england and they came from norway so it was mm. a, a a a completely different um influential criteria mm. um so yeah there was a necessary you know there, there is a warmth in our, our stuff i think um a collective warmth um, it's a naive record. It, you know, we were young. We were trying to formulate a a sound which had already been in, a, you know, this process with three demos. Uh, we kind of dropped the, the death metal sensibilities. We came from, like, say, from the the ear. Well, I'd say more peaceful school of thought than earache. It was the darker, 
um, British bands, like I said, Paradise Lost, Chorus of Ruin, Anathema, uh, My Dying Bride, uh, Decomposed, etc. Andrea Mayer, we brought in, who was kind of our satanic advisor at the time. And uh, she came and did some great, sexy, Germanic narrative <laughs> on that record. So, um, yeah, I think that adds to the sort of the viciousness and seductiveness of the record as well. Yeah. There's definitely a very strong vampiric feel about the principal and vampire and dusk and her embrace. Yeah. And even to sense um, the nature of uh, Elizabeth Bathory for Cruelty the Beast as well. I've got to ask, what's involved in being a satanic advisor? Well, she was um, privy to and a member of a, um, several organisations. Notably, I think, uh, well, she's not around anymore, if you aware that she got killed two years ago she was shot um when that guy went mental with a with a, a crossbow in was somewhere in norway i don't i'm not sure if it was oslo or not um yeah yeah i was very saddened to hear about her passing obviously she was married to samoth at one point as well from emperor mm. um yeah so basically she just came along to the studio she would we do rituals and uh, we're very much into the satanic doctrine back then. She'd come along to photo shops and uh, photo shops, photo shoots, and preside over them. We did a very famous one at Clop Hill, which is a, a church. It was reputed to have been destroyed by Satanists. We did a big um, photo shoot, shoot there um, with fire and brimstone and blood and Sick. yeah, um, very much annoyed the local populace that evening. Yeah, so she was, when I say satanic advisor, she was um, she was privy to the band. She was around the band, reintegrated her into the album. She danced for the band as well. Um, yeah, she was uh, quite an important member back then. Satan's an interesting concept in terms of the, the people involved in, especially in black metal, who took it seriously and the people who didn't. We, we all took it very seriously at the time. I don't know if you can call that uh childish overzealousness yeah or the fact that everybody discovered the genre and wanted to make their point everybody's very much into it and in some respects i really miss that um early naivety um because yeah it was naive but it was also the thing that moved so many people it was very magical very magical times and I very much miss that. I find there's that is something, a glue, that, an essence that is missing from modernity, just the same as the Dark Ages compared to modernity. The attributions of witchcraft and demonology and everything has a home in darker times. Black metal flourished in that time because it was a mysterious era. Um, devoid of, like I say, the trappings of modernity, like mobile phones and the internet and Wikipedia and um, streaming platforms and, you know, everything that nowadays uh, metal music is privy to. What do you think the most important contribution was of black metal to the history of heavy metal, as a final question? Before then, you had all these silly things like Priest being dragged into court for allegedly backmasking records. I mean, what the fuck? During this big witch hunt of, of metal in the 80s, suddenly was happening there in the 90s, for real. I personally laugh when people look back with uh, rose-tinted spectacles and or lie about their involvement in said scene. There was a, a festival called De The Day of Death in London um, that yeah. was organised by Harry Armstrong from decomposed and it's kind of legendary there was a, everybody says they were there there was like only about 110 people there to start with so I, i've heard thousands of people claim they were there um it does make me me laugh because it was so burgeoning at the time and it happened things happened very fast mm. but when we were at the thick of it it was tiny there was no one was into it literally it was a handful of people here handful a cluster there count the amount of people in one hand on the tape trading scene was tiny as well. And it was just amazing how the touch paper was lit. And yeah, when you write the history of metal, it will be a big chapter on 
on the events of those, you know, those few years from 80, well, I'd say from 91, 90, 91 through to about 95. Those were the glory years yeah. of, you know, the origins of black metal. And yeah, it, after that, it got, people always moan about how we made it quite public and. You made it off. too popular. We were way better when we were, um, yeah, only good on our um, unreleased first demo that we that we came out as a brown triangle in Iran. That's when we were at our, our peak of our powers. <laughs>